Not as much of a trade-off. Well, my name is Ranger Dan Stevens. I am a park ranger interpreter here at DeSoto National Memorial, and welcome. Our job out here is to accomplish the park's mission, which is to commemorate the DeSoto Expedition and its impact on the Native society. What we do out here is we talk about different facets and different topics of the expedition. So what I'll cover this hour is the reasons that bring two things. We'll talk about the reasons that bring the Spanish or the Europeans here in the first place, and also its biggest impact of what was the biggest and largest impact of the coming of the Europeans have on the Native Americans here up in North America. So to start off with, we're gonna have to go back in time, way back in time, to talk about the reasons behind the exploration and the, uh, the conquest of the Americas. This story goes back even further than 1492, and to test my kids, what happens in 1492? Columbus, Columbus Blue, exactly. Columbus discovered Italy. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, he discovered India, or at least he thought he did. But actually, this story goes back to the 1200s on why does Europe come here? And then back in the 1200s, they weren't even thinking about coming here. But back in the 1200s, there was a conflict going on, a world conflict going on at that time called the Crusades. The Crusades. <laughs> <laughs> was when Europe was at war with the Middle East over who was going to gain rights and entrance into Jerusalem. Mostly it was also due to land and money. But one empire benefited the most from the Crusades, and that's the Empire of Venice. A mercantile empire right there on that coast of Italy. Their job was to ferry Crusade knights from France, England, Spain, and Germany over the Med into the Middle East. Why they were doing that, the Doge of Venice, the leader of Venice, realizes a business opportunity. A little place called the Suez. Today there's a canal, but back then, before there was a canal, there was a narrow land bridge between the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean. What Venice did is since they were ferrying people back and forth, at some times they started establishing trading outposts on both sides of the Suez. Then they started ferrying and carrying ships across the land bridge there. So now they have ships in the Indian Ocean and in the Mediterranean. And then the ships in the Indian Ocean started going to places like India and China. The Europeans did know about them even though it was before Marco Polo. But mostly before then, all goods had to be carried over land called the Silk Road. And that was very perilous. It took a lot of time. But now Venice had ships to do it like that. And what they started to do was bring back spices from India and China. Spices like black pepper, currant, curry, nutmeg, cinnamon. And they were the only trading empire that did so. So they were the ones that set the market price. So now we're going to flash forward about 300 years up to the 1500s. Now, Venice is still the sole proprietor of spices in Europe, but now they can charge whatever they want. One ship full of black pepper is equal to four ships full of gold. If you were a low-born noblewoman, you could marry a high-born noble if your dowry contained nutmeg. And one pound of cinnamon was worth seven fat knocks. That was the market price that Venice would set. And that is why Portugal and Spain saw opportunity. And where our little Genoese Italian sea captain comes in. Now, Christopher Columbus is a map maker by trade, a navigator. And Christopher Columbus belonged to a school of thought. That school of thought was from an ancient Greek philosopher who believed the world was 12,000 miles shorter than most Europeans believed. All of Europe believed that the world was round. They believed that the world was round in a certain mileage or circumference, but they believed that you could not travel from Europe to Asia in one trip. Of course, they didn't know about North and South America, though, yet either. So when Columbus said, I don't believe the world is 12,000 miles or shorter, we can make it in one trip, Portugal laughed at him. Italy laughed at him. The Netherlands laughed at him. But Isabella didn't. She kept him for 
10 years. Then in 1492, Spain ended a 780 year long war. That's right, a 780 year war called the Reconquista. Started in 711 and ended in 1492. That, that war they fought against the Moors from North Africa, a race of Muslims that crossed the Strait of Gibraltar. It's a non-stop war. And in that war, you would have a certain warrior class, a religious warrior class, forged in that conflict called the Conquistador, literally translated as conqueror. The Conquistador was a holy warrior who was basically a super soldier of Spain. These are the men that the king of Spain would say, cross that uncrossable river, forge that unforgeable stream, conquer that unconquerable people, and the conquistadors will do it or die trying. Now in 1492, Christopher Columbus sails west out of Spain. He believes he's gonna hit Asia. He then in October 13, 1492, hits an island. He sees the brown people that live on the island. He now believes he's off the coast of India, so he names them Indian. Indians. And then he sets off exploring, trying to find the main coast of India and China to get black pepper, get curry, get curry and many other things. He's beaten Portugal, who decided to go south around the Horn of Africa to get to India. But he doesn't find pepper, or he doesn't find black pepper. He finds red peppers. He finds jalapenos and habaneros. He finds bell peppers. He finds potatoes, tomatoes, and possibly the biggest bounty to some of us, he finds cacao or chocolate. And he brings those back to Europe. The king of Spain is at first very upset. He's not going to have his bounty of spices. But then they calm down Ferdinand a little bit, and he realizes he's got a whole new market of spices to corner. So now they start to sink colonists. And within four voyages, Columbus has mapped out most of the Caribbean, and now he does believe, uh-oh, we're not off the coast of England. Columbus will die in disgrace, though. Brought back to Spain in chains for not accomplishing his goals of finding Asia. But more will come over. And then you'll have a conquest of the New World. First starting with the Caribbean. Cuba will become the, the crown center of the Spanish New World. Reaching out to the Yucatan, Mexico will fall, and then Central America, and then later South America. But Florida becomes an obstacle to Spain. By 1539, when DeSoto gets here, three conquistadors have come here and three have died. Ponce de Leon, Lucas de Ayon, and Barfilio de Narvaez, all dead in Florida. Now DeSoto is going to believe he's going to do it. And this is where we're going to talk about the last subject. How does this expedition change everything? Well, they bring in one thing that changes everything. They bring in pigs. There were no swine in North America before the Europeans. Pigs are aliens. No wild pigs, no wild boar, no hogzillas, no razorbacks. Nothing. The only wild swine in the Americas is the taper. That was in South America. Native Americans only at this time have five domesticated animals. They have the Muscovian duck, wild turkey, or not wild, but turkey, dogs, guinea pigs, and llamas. Any of those livestock? Maybe if you have a herd of guinea pigs. But none of those are livestock. So how does the pig change everything? Well, first of all, pigs are adaptable. Pigs within six generations will revert back to a wild state. A female sow gives birth every six months. Six months after that, its children, offspring, can give birth as well. So now you have a turnover. Within six of those generations, it's a rule of six, 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 six generations, boom, you have wild boar, wild hogs. Now they start to root up everything. The natives, though, due to the Spanish have learned to kill them and cook them. But the problem is this. Native Americans have never in their history come in contact with livestock. What does that mean? In Europe, even in Mesopotamia and China, those people have been in contact with livestock for thousands of years. So that means that in our bodies, we have immunities to livestock-borne illnesses. A lot of people don't realize how many of our illnesses we get from animals. Native Americans
Americans had 36 disease markers. Europeans have a standard of about 64 to 68 disease markers in our, in our DNA. Native Americans, when they start to introduce livestock into their, their populations, now are susceptible to anthrax, swine flu, cholera due to the runoff of their waste, measles, smallpox, rubella, and many other illnesses that are gonna transfer between swine and native. In 1539, there was an estimated upwards of 20 million population in the Southeast. Within 150 years of coming in contact with pigs, 95% of that population is gone due to disease alone. Why is it incidental? Yes, the Europeans didn't understand modalities, pathogen. The Soto himself might have been responsible for less than 1% of the death of the population due to warfare. It's the introduction of these pigs that changes everything. Nowadays, you want to see what an invasive exotic species does? There are 47 states that have pigs, wild pigs in them today. Pigs are responsible for about two to three billion dollars worth of damage in Florida alone. From livestock, private ownership, and industry. That's the game changer. That's the legacy of this expedition. That's how the Soto's expedition changes North America. We're gonna do now is we're gonna talk about a couple of these things. I didn't bring these weapons out here just for you to look at and go, ooh, what do they do? I brought these out here to show you what they do. No, 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 no. We talked about the biggest weapon that the Spanish brought were the pigs, even though they didn't know that was the biggest weapon that they brought. But the Spanish would bring many weapons. Their deadliest weapon that they would bring is the sword. Why? Because everybody in this expedition was equipped with one of these. It's a handy weapon. And by this time in Europe, the sword was at the pinnacle of its design. Swords before this, in the Middle Ages, were clunky things, made of thick metal. But due to that invasion of the Moors in Spain, the Moors are gonna bring along a steel-making technology that we even enjoy today called Damascus steel. The Damascans and later the Toledians in, in Spain learned a way to make metal that does something miraculous. It does this. Ready? Ready to do it all? It goes boing, 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 boing. That's it. That's all it is. But that changes everything. Because now my sword can vibrate, it can bend every time it strikes metal. It will not break on me in the middle of combat. And now it survives generations. So it gives something that I can hand down to my son he can hand down to his son, becomes a center part of the European family. The European soldiers, because they're not outfitted by DeSoto, are asked to bring whatever they have on their backs, whatever they carry. That's gonna be everything from axes, maces and hammers, to even flails and morning stars. They're gonna bring on with them everything that they're gonna to use to kill opponents in Europe. They'll even bring along, their horsemen will bring their lances, which will be one of the most deadliest weapons that DeSoto will bring, the lance, responsible for more deaths during the expedition than any other edge weapon. And for his personal guard, they'll bring along the halberd. This is the can opener of the European society. The halberd is the oldest weapon still used in modern militaries today. Can anyone name the modern military unit that still uses and trains with this weapon? Anyone? They, they guard a guy that wears a very funny pointed hat, lives in a city of his own. Huh? The Pope. The Swiss guard that guards the Pope today were leased out to the Pope in the 1500s. Swiss guardsmen today still train in the use of this weapon to guard the pontiff. Of course, they also train in the use of FAMAS machine guns and other things, but they still use this weapon. The way this weapon works is it's a three-in-one multi-tool. If I got a guy charging at me on horseback, I brace and lean. That horse is gonna run up on that blade. After I stop that horse, then my job will be to go up with the hook, snag the knight, pull him off, and end his life. 
The Spanish would fight in units called tercios. In those tercios, the first four ranks of Spaniards will be equipped with halberd axes to stop horse charges. The Spanish De Soto's expedition will also come equipped with this weapon, the crossbow. The crossbow is an ancient weapon ending the re end of its lifespan in Europe. It's basically a bow and arrow on a stick. But with this, I could train anybody with its use. I could haul anybody out of a bar, sober them up, and within about 30 minutes, they'll be shooting nobles off a horseback. The use to design this weapon is rather simple. It involves a revolving nut that catches on a lever. That revolving nut then catches the bowstring. Then all I gotta do is load and fire. There we go, kind of the same thing. The Native Americans are gonna counter with this weapon, the bow and arrow. Of course, Europe has used the bow and arrow for centuries, but no longer really are at this point. But this weapon is the top weapon in Native America. Native American children starting about the age of, how old are you? Six, about two more years, about eight. will start using and training with this weapon. Then they'll be able to go out, hunt, fish, and even fight and be able to shoot 15 arrows in 30 seconds. They'll be trained in the art of hiding. Using ambush warfare, they can wait for the Spanish to cross by, uh, by them, hiding in those woods, they're virtually invisible, and then they can reach out and strike their opponents. And also, while in cover, they can draw, run, and fire and disappear off into the woods. The Spanish would complain that it was being like being attacked by ghosts. The Indians were gone there and then gone again. This would prove an issue with main Spanish weapons being brought at this time. A weapon that was taking over all warfare in Europe. The gun. The age of gunpowder had arrived. Gunpowder had been first brought into Europe in the 1200s. Then later, gunpowder was refined from the use of crude weapons like the gong, which is a gun tube on a stick. The Europeans would come up with the arquebus. It's a long gun tube on a longer stick, a barrel on a stock. Then the Germans would add a system of firing called the lock. The lock, stock, and barrel would be your entire weapon system. This gun was excellent in Europe. With a 40 yard range of accuracy, I would then wait for my, unit, my the opposing army to line up shoulder to shoulder and march straight at me. Then I would level my gun and fire right into you. If you were 40 yards away, the bullet was gonna stray. It would go up and hit her, her, him, or whoever. But as long as you were an enemy, it doesn't really matter. But here in North America, no matter how nice and polite I was to the natives, they're not gonna line up and march straight at me. They're gonna run through those woods. They're gonna attack me individually. And that's where the problem with this weapon comes about. How many arrows did I say can be shot in 30 seconds? Remember? 15. There we go. 15 arrows in 30 seconds. Let's see how good I am with this gun. I've been using it for about seven to eight years. So we'll see my rate of fire. When I say go, I'd like you to start counting. Don't stop counting until you hear a boom. Count one Mississippi, two Mississippi, and so on and so forth, and we'll see how long it takes me to get one shot off. So without further ado, I'm walking through the woods when all of a sudden arrows come flying at me from everywhere. Go. One, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi, seven Mississippi, eight Mississippi, nine Mississippi, 10 Mississippi, 11 Mississippi, 12 Mississippi, 13 Mississippi, 14 Mississippi, 15 Mississippi, 16 Mississippi, 17 Mississippi, 18 Mississippi, 19 Mississippi, 20 Mississippi, 21 Mississippi, 22 Mississippi.
Sometimes it doesn't go off the first time. There we go. And it set your gloves on fire. Got to let it. 24 seconds. What it takes. So with all of this problem, it does end up saving the expedition. At the end of this, this perilous quest, DeSoto's intrepid explorers and conquerors are beaten. Soto himself is dead. They've tried, they've given up and they've tried to walk down into Mexico, but decide it's way too long of a journey. So they turn back. They march to the Mississippi River there in Arkansas. And then they notice that the gunners, the arquebusiers, still have all their weapons. But they have no black powder, no shot, so they're useless. So the blacksmiths will confiscate these guns, break them down, lock, stock, and barrel, and make nails out of them. And with those nails, they'll build boats, and then they'll sail out down the Mississippi River on those guns, saving 311 out of 1,000 men, women, and children that came on this expedition. We thank you very much for attending our program.